Welcome to the first episode of $5 Tuesdays, the patron portion of the cinema specialist. So if you are a patron, uh, whether you're a Survivor fan, a movie fan, if you're both at the lowest tier, at the $5 tier, the $5 Tuesdays will be in there. Uh, the good news is, unlike going to a regular movie theater, this won't cost you $5 every Tuesday. It'll just cost you $5 once a month. And uh, John and I are going to be talking about, at least in the initial part of this series, Movies that are on big anniversaries. So this first one we're going to be talking about, 20th anniversary of Mean Girls. Yes, 2024, <laughs> Mean Girls is 20 years old. But even more important than that, Mean Girls is coming out on January 12th. So we are talking about this one. We're putting this out as our YouTube episode that uh, is a preview of the Patreon content. So you'll get an idea. We are going to be a little spoilery in these episodes. I mean, these movies are all pretty old at this point, so you kind of should know the gist of them if you haven't seen them. Also, these first couple of movies we're talking about, I'm assuming most of you have seen. If you haven't seen Mean Girls, go watch it. It's a classic. Um, but we're also going to be talking about the the impact that it's had, the historic, mm -hmm. you know, the, the cultural impact that these movies have had um, as we move away from them, ones that maybe had a huge impact at the time and maybe they've fallen off, ones that didn't have a huge impact and now have one, ones that have been consistent. And maybe we're going to be talking about some movies in the future that really haven't made their way into the um, the culture as much as they should have and, and really have kind of disappeared. But first, we're talking about Mean Girls, our first $5 Tuesdays. John, how often do you watch Mean Girls? Are you one of the people who watches Mean Girls on Mean Girls Day? I am. Usually. Sometimes I'll take a break for a year and be like, you know what? I watched it recently enough. So this year ended up being a double watch of Mean Girls year uh, just because of this podcast. But yeah, I, it's for the most part because it's just a fun movie. Mm -hmm. And and why is it Mean Girls Day? Why is October 3rd Mean Girls Day? There, There's a scene in Mean Girls where, um, where the date is asked and it is October 3rd. Ah, oh, okay. So that's the part where the, the good looking guy turns around and says October 3rd. Okay. That makes a lot that's more right. sense. Okay. Okay. That makes sense because I was wondering as I was watching the movie, I was like, okay, I, I forget what the date is. And then I was kind of paying attention for dates, but clearly I was not, it didn't register and click in my brain. And then when I rewatch, like when I went and looked it up afterwards, I'm like, what was October 3rd? But anyway, okay. Yeah. I've only seen this movie. This is probably the second or third time I've seen it. I actually haven't seen it that many times. So, you know, it like the back of your hand, I don't, but just talking about from a cultural impact, we are talking about a movie that has a day dedicated to it because mm -hmm. a day is asked. And I think when you're talking about a movie that's 20 years old, where there's a lot of stuff that's, you know, aged poorly, at least in terms of dialogue and stuff, we'll talk about that. I mean, that's something I'm yeah. always, I'm very forgiving of that in movies. And I know some people aren't, but I think it's unfair to have present day expectations of a movie that is old because, you know, it's just a different time. Um, however, you know, for a movie that's aged and, and, you know, has been around, has a musical, uh, Broadway musical now is going to have a musical film coming out mm -hmm. or it to have a day dedicated to it. There's not many movies that can say that What well, I, the only one I can think of off the top of my head is star Wars, <laughs> star Wars, star Trek with Federation day. Okay. Um, but yeah, for the most part, you have to reach a certain point in the cultural zeitgeist to have a day dedicated to you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I host isn't a, just uh, like the anniversary uh, of the release. Yeah, exactly, exactly. I think that's a good point too. I host a bar trivia in um in Florida, and uh, the amount of teams I get that are like, "We wear pink on Wednesdays." Stop trying to make fetch a thing. Uh, it, you just you get it. Like I, I remember getting those and being like, why do I know what that is? Fetch. I, I knew, but when I, when it was, we wear pink on Tuesdays or on Wednesdays is Wednesday. my pod. Oh, my, Tuesdays, my trivia is on sense. Tuesdays. Mm -hmm. So they say we wear pink on Wednesdays, but my trivia is on Tuesdays. So the team was, we wear pink on Tuesdays. And I was like, Hmm, why does, why does that resonate? And then I watched the movie again this time. I'm like, Oh, so Pete, like that's how much of an impact it's making though. Right? Like you're, you're mm -hmm. becoming the cultural reference of people who are going and doing trivias at bars on yeah. random days of the week and random parts of the state of Florida. So I just think that's really cool. But uh, yeah, John, why don't you, why don't, since you've seen this movie much more than I have, why don't you give the brief breakdown of, of what mean girls is for anybody who somehow has gone 20 years without knowing. Yeah. So Katie Heron has been homeschooled her entire life uh, while living in Africa with her parents, but mom gets a job at, 
Northwestern. So now it's time for her to brave the jungles of high school instead. Uh -huh. And we are introduced to every single high school trope you can think of, but most importantly, the cliquish nature of high school and how to navigate it and how to just live with it, get through girl world mm -hmm. and make it to the end of high school without becoming a mean girl. Yeah. And I think it was fun to watch this movie so closely to bottoms which was the one that mm -hmm. came out in 2023 that was obviously very inspired by this and, you know, fight club, they talk about a lot, yeah. but it's fun to watch the difference in, in kind of how these movies go. High school movies over time are a very interesting one to watch. Cause when you watch mm -hmm. a high school movie or a movie that as at least high school involved in, even if it's not a high school comedy, you are seeing what the youth is actually like during that time period, right? Because if you go back and watch the horror movies of the 80s, whatever high school looks like there is what the youth wants to imagine high school looks like. That's who they're targeting, right? They're targeting with like the Friday 13th movies and these slasher movies and things like that. They're targeting the youth. And so to watch Mean Girls in 2000, which came out in 2004, and I was only 12, so I wasn't quite into high school yet. I was two years removed. I was in seventh grade when that movie came out. Um, to see that, it really does bring you back a little bit to like, oh yeah, this is pretty close to what my high school thing was where you had the girls mm -hmm. who would wear the same clothes. And, you know, one thing that's not really shown a lot in this movie is the jock aspect of things. And I feel like that was around the time where like the, in my school football was a very big deal. Um, but it felt like the jock aspect of things was kind of moving towards the wayside, but you get that homeschooled person homeschooling was a thing. It wasn't a predominant thing, but it was a thing. And then you get that homeschool person who all of a sudden comes into the regular world of, of, of high school. And we had, we did actually have one girl in our class who was homeschooled all the way up through, I think her freshman year. I don't think she was even in okay. school in her freshman year. And then she comes in and like, obviously, you know, when you're Lindsay Lohan, it's going to be a little bit easier for you to get involved in high school, but it was a fun, it was, it's a fun take on all of that. And, uh, I, I love the watching in a time capsule uh, aspect of it because this was not far removed from when you and I were actually in high school. No. And, and people our age are the target audience of this film, right? Because the way young adult fiction is created, it's created to target an age just below what it's depicting. Mm -hmm. So this movie is, is literally for us to teach us lessons so that we aren't like the way some of these people behave in this movie by the time we get to that age. Mm -hmm. And there are so many things when I'm watching this movie that I just think about, this isn't my high school experience, but I uh, is that because I was at a smaller high school? Is it because I was in Canada instead of the US? Like how much of that? And I think this is a more relatable movie for we Canadians because it doesn't have that jock aspect as much mm -hmm. because obviously like football's huge down, down there and it's not a thing here, right? Like it's not an event that happens every week in Canada, like it is down there. Mm -hmm. So high school athletics never really felt like this big thing, which puts a bit of a disconnect in some of these other teen comedies that are focused on high school. Yeah, no, that makes sense. And obviously bottoms, which we were just talking about, like, that does it in such an extreme way that it's unrecognizable yeah. to everybody anyway. But no. And, and so we talk a lot when we do our movie podcast, when we, when we talk about our Marvel movies and whatever relevant movie is out or recent movie. And when we talked about our top 100, one of the main things that we always talk about is like how something is being told, right? What mm -hmm. like, okay. Every movie wants to have a message, but how is that message coming across? Is it coming across with a sledgehammer to the skull or is it coming across subtly? And this movie's not subtle. There's nothing subtle about Mean Girls. However, I really appreciated a lot of the decisions that were made, like such as the jock stuff is kind of pushed to the side, even though you can see that like, you know, they're involved. I think they play soccer a little bit at this school. Um, but for instance, like the scene where Tina Fey has, where they have the, the middle school, uh, the girl, what is it? Junior year girl uh, assembly. And, yep. and she has them all close their eyes and raise their hands and stuff like that. There's your like feminist statement, right? Of like girls need to look yep. out for girls. Women need to look out for women. There's your statement of that. And I was really impressed with how well that scene has aged 
Because mm-hmm. that is one of the more iconic scenes from the movie when everybody's raising their hand and they're all looking at each other and they're all starting to talk it out. And Regina George tries to get up and leave and then everybody raises their hand that she's like ruined their lives in some way. Then they do the falling thing where they all say their apology and fall. Uh, that has actually aged really, really well. And I talk a lot about how there's so many things we watch in newer movies that don't age well and feel super dated or feel super corny because they're just trying to hit you so hard over the head with the fact of like, this is the message of our movie. I found that to almost feel sort of realistic, which was weird mm-hmm. because I'm sitting there watching this 20 years later. And as that scene was coming up, I was saying to myself, Ooh, this isn't gonna, this is going to be so cringy. And it wasn't. And I was so pleased with that. And it felt like a real high school situation in the early two thousands, but it also at the same time felt like, okay, this is your, this is what mean girls is about. Mm-hmm. That, this is what it's about. It's about, Teenage girls who are being absolutely horrible to each other. And it doesn't matter if you're the best looking girl at the school or if you're the ugliest girl at the school. Everybody has mean people in their cliques. And you're all being horrible to each other. And you all talk crap about each other. You all do this. And yet it comes across like, I don't know, it just comes across so well. I was I was very impressed with how well that scene, 20 years old now, has aged. Yeah. The movie almost has this sense of timelessness to it, aside from the fact that you know, there's no smartphones and not everyone's on the internet. The fact that there's a physical book in this movie is yeah, is kind of impressive and dates itself. Other than that, and I mean, maybe we kind of lost touch with what high school is like. I like it. It hasn't been that long since I was teaching in high school. Hmm. It's kind of stayed the same. Like yeah, I mean, it, every- it doesn't feel it doesn't feel as drastically different as like high school in the eighties and the way it's depicted in eighties and nineties movies is mm-hmm. to the way high school was for you and I, as we grew up. Well, and especially one of the movies we're going to be talking about in this series, you know, and it towards the end of this month is uh karate kid. Mm-hmm. And I feel like in the eighties, so many of the movies were so heavy on the, the villains, like the, the bullies, but they were so yeah. unrealistic. Regina George, the reason why Regina George works so well is because Regina George still exists in every single high school in North America. I don't know enough about high school in Europe to to say anything, but in North America, I can tell you with 100% certainty, there is a Regina George in every single school. It doesn't matter what socioeconomic standing you're in. It doesn't matter what part of the country you're in. There is a Regina George who is the really, really attractive girl who is absolutely mean to everybody who is is just so full of herself that she can't see anything else that 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 person exists in every school and i think that's why this works really really well is is like regina george at this point is is a realistic villain 80s 80s high school villains weren't realistic 90s high school villains eh, it kind of depended on what movie you're watching but regina george and the plastics you see them every single every single school you go into yeah and i think it helps at this film is set in the midwest too Mm -hmm. i think that just like brings it down to this more like every man type of status which is a weird thing to say but when you think about a lot of the high school movies from the 80s a lot of them are set in california right yeah and that changes the way you approach it and and because of that there's a lot more like wealth discrepancy in those films where we're not seeing yes there's there is wealth discrepancy in this film, but it doesn't seem as pronounced as it would be in one of some of those eight earlier movies. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I, we get into the fact that, you know, she's super wealthy. Regina George's parents mm-hmm. are super wealthy, but it's not something that's harped on so much to the point where like, that's what she's talking about. Right. It's, it's, yeah. it's, it's kind of background noise. I mean, you're also having Tina Fey and Amy Poehler coming off of Saturday night live. They haven't really made their way into mainstream at this point. Um, beyond that, like 30 rock Mm -hmm. hadn't come out yet. I'm not quite sure what Amy Poehler's career. I don't, I didn't follow her obviously as closely. This was Um, pre parks and rec. So yeah, this was pre parks and rec. So you're talking like before Amy Poehler and Tina Fey became household names, they were Saturday night live names, but they weren't necessarily household names. You didn't know that they were going to be able to make that jump. And I think that this movie really showed the comedic timing and the elements that they Mm -hmm. understood. I know that a lot of people will look at this movie and they'll find certain things to be offensive or certain elements to be offensive. And I'm always somebody who goes back. I mean, I talk about American beauty as my second favorite movie of all Mm -hmm. time. And, and I sit here and I say like, it's really hard to judge these, these past movies on what we're concerned with right now, because at the time that's not what the concern was. Right. Or maybe, maybe that wasn't seen as, as offensive. And now over time it's built up such a, 
such a stigma or such a, you know, whatever baggage. I can't think of the the right word for this, but you really could see like Tina Fey was just so ahead of her, ahead of her time when, when it came to yeah. making this type of movie, because she understood what was going to bridge the gap to the point where straight guys will sit down and watch this movie like willingly, not just because yeah. it's will, it will go out of their way to watch this movie. That wasn't happening with most female teen comedies or female mm -hmm. uh, oriented teen comedies up until this point. And so Tina Fey just got it. Like she just knew how to hit all of those beats that were going to keep people involved. And, um, and like she, I mean, her, her character is very funny in this too, but mm -hmm. you really see like her comedy was going to branch beyond just, you know, the target audience of what a lot of female comedians were unfortunately being lumped into up to this point. A lot of them were just being lumped into, okay, you're for the female audience. That's what you're going to be in this movie for, or you're going to be in a rom-com or something like that. That's going to get the female audience. This was kind of bridging that gap a little bit. Yeah, as much as this movie is about female empowerment and, and making it so that women realize that they shouldn't be tearing each other down because it allows men to do the same thing, it really is about kind of working towards this. It, it's weird to say from this comedy from 20 years ago, but like it's really working towards bringing more equality to society. And it, it just feels so much deeper than just this high school comedy because it does work at bridging that gap like you said it take it takes these concepts that were so gendered at the time and really breaks them down and makes it so that they're easily accessible to everyone and it also has the girls talking a little bit like guys which mm -hmm. i think was something that kind of started to shock people as women started writing more like more and more mainstream scripts was I know like a lot of guys would be like oh my god that's the kind of humor that's in this i mean that's why book smart a movie that you and i both yeah. love it's a movie where, you know, they're talking the way that women really talk, which isn't this like super over the top way that was being shown in the 80s and the 90s. It was like every conversation was, oh, my God, did you see what that boy did? And like, that's the extent of that conversation in this one. When they're talking about the clothes they wear, why they're wearing the clothes, the impact that they're going to have, why you can't be seen with this person or that person or the reasons why you can't talk about, you know, you can't sleep with this person for this reason. And the way, you know, I think one of the big parts of this movie is when they're talking about uh, Halloween is every every girl's excuse to dress like a slut and they can't be slut shamed yep. for it. And you weren't hearing things like that be said in a movie prior to this. Maybe I'm wrong, mm -hmm. but I think that was not something that you were seeing up to this point. Yeah, I, I and I think that's the big thing is that it really, I think it really opens the eyes to the raunchy teen comedy isn't a male genre it's a teen yeah. genre and it is a genre that everyone connects with because they've all experienced it and having that freedom to have these discussions in this female-led ensemble film just allows for people to regular like just it makes it more regular for people mm -hmm. to have those conversations in general and <laughs> i can't believe we're here saying this but mean girls really broke down a lot of social barriers Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't, I don't disagree with you. I mean, I think that, um, the fact that it was getting into the fact too, that, you know, the cliques in high school, yeah, we all knew that the cliques existed, but getting into the fact of like, like I said earlier, every click having its own thing, when you're talking about the social barriers with that, where it's like, you all act like you're so different from each other, but every single one of you has the exact same thing. And that's why you, when you were talking mm -hmm. about these high school comedies and stuff that are coming out now feel very similar. It's because at the end of the day, high school comedies are about the awkward feelings of like young, like sexual urges, right? Like, and who's mm -hmm. going to sleep with who and who's going to do this and who's going to do that uh, feeling uh, included, not neglected, like just finding friendship and all that, no matter what group you're in, you're going to have that. And so, you know, we have, we have, um, you know, what is it? The, the, the Asian group. And then we have the unfriendly, what was it? The unfriendly black group. I think that's what they call it in this movie or something mm -hmm. like that. But it was also kind of showing that they're real. like, you're this click, you're this click, you're this click, you're this click. It doesn't matter. Every single one of those has a Regina George. Every single one of those has whatever Amanda Seyfried's name is. Every single one of those has a Gretchen Wieners. And every single one of those is going to have new people who keep coming in and they're all going to hate 
other groups just as much as they're being hated by whatever other group is hating them or thinks they're weird. Yeah, it really just goes to show that everyone's high school experience, though incredibly individualized, is really the same. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter where you fall. Everyone's kind of going through the same thing. And that's why the end of this film is so poignant. Just like as everything breaks down towards the end and as, you know, these barriers between people are breaking down, it feels like a maturation of all of the characters. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, yeah. Like, it, like the, the real world's still very cliquish. And, you know, it's very idealized to think that you're breaking into all these other groups. Yeah. Now, in terms of like other characters, you have Lizzie Kaplan, who mm -hmm. obviously has had a pretty had a pretty solid career. Um, yeah. You know, Lindsay Lohan. Uh, I couldn't tell you who plays Gretchen Wieners um, because I don't feel like she actually ever really went on to become that big of a star. Amanda Seyfried obviously goes on to like have a really good career. Um, what 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 is, what else did what Lacey she wrote? Yeah, what else was she in? Uh, I know that? She was a child actor, wasn't she? She was in was one she? of those like sitcoms of the nineties, I believe. Okay, okay. It might be but either, that up, but I'm, like this, I'm pretty sure that's the case. This movie launched a lot of careers and like made people start to take other careers more seriously. Like obviously, Lindsay Lohan up to this point was was already a big name. She'd been in the Parent Trap and a lot of stuff like that. But it was man, she can really carry her own movie. And then obviously, Lindsay Lohan had her falling out and everything like that. But um. There was a, there was a lot of like star power in this movie and like Rachel McAdams 2004 yeah. was a heck of a year for her because what was Wedding Crashers 2003 or 2004? Uh, Wedding Crashers later. This is the same year as the Notebook. That's what it was, and then Wedding Crashers was 2005. So she was in this and the Notebook, and then the next year in Wedding Crashers. Yeah. Also, 26 uh, pretty, years old in this movie. Just so everybody yeah. knows. Yeah, pretty big way to catapult her career there. Yeah. Yeah, good for good for Rachel McAdams. I mean, and she, I mean, she plays Regina George great. I mean, that might that honestly okay. might be her best performance. It's funny because you know she gets like the Oscar nom for Spotlight, and like she gets talked about for these other movies. But this might be the best she's ever been in a movie. I mean, it really is something that you just can't stop watching. You want to know what bitchy yeah. thing is she can do next? Yeah, she has this. It, it's great the way that the character is written because she has that gravity to her that pulls mm -hmm. you in. That just it makes you understand why a character, like why a person like this is so popular yeah. and why everyone wants to be close to her and in her orbit because you're just, you just want to know what's going to happen next because everyone else around you kind of feels that way too. And it, it really goes to show how artificial the hierarchy of high school is. Yeah. Well, and then you have um, the burn book stuff. I mean, the burn book stuff is fantastic. That I love that stuff so much. And so you have the burn book. And when she decides that she's going to write, this is the biggest thought I've ever met and puts her own picture there so that it looks like yeah. it's coming from Katie is, is such a great moment. Um, but like, it just shows like what a nasty person she was and how she just wanted mm -hmm. to be, you know, at the top and like, you know, whatever she could do to keep the power that she felt that she had in this little world. But I do agree with you at the very end of the movie, then they show the three new plastics who are walking and they get fake hit by the bus and then they come, you know, and then it's just kidding. They're fine. And they don't get hit by the bus, but their hair gets messed up or something. It's like, that's the idea of right now, Regina, Ke Regina George might be at the, the pinnacle, the pinnacle of her, her entire life. <laughs> you know what mm -hmm. I mean? So yeah. um, to see that character and then with the burn book and like, it gets mean, but this movie is mean, but I also yeah. think like, I think that our generation right now, and a lot of like people, they, they lean towards being offended more than they do of just like laughing. And I feel like this movie does a really good job of, of, of towing that line. Mm -hmm. And like, I mean, look, I'm going to be offended by a lot less stuff than other people are going to be offended by. That's just kind of like how it goes. But when I watch this movie and, and you do watch it with that 20 year old lens, there are a couple things where I'm like, I can't believe they actually put that in there. But at the same time, I was laughing and I'm not afraid to admit that I was laughing. And, you know, maybe there's gonna be people who are going to look at that and say, oh, I was offended by that. But I, this movie aged really, really well. And mm -hmm. um, even the way it handles the 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 gay character relationship with with the uh, with the girl, when they lean in for the kiss, you're always like, oh, God. And I, I forgot about that part. So when he leans in for the kiss, I was like, oh, that's cheesy. And then he immediately like spits it out. And he's like, nope, God, that was terrible. And I'm just like, yeah, I love that. I absolutely yeah. love that. That's perfection. Um, so. Yeah, I mean, what do you think about about those kinds of things? I know you're. I'm not saying you're sensitive, but you're a little bit more. Uh, you're a little bit more aligned with 
I am. What's offensive there? There is some language in this movie that uh, has not aged well, mm-hmm. um, which is very of the time. And, and that's the thing with movies. It's it's hard to properly judge a movie based on, like like you said, right? Like you can't really use our modern lens to completely judge a movie by because movies are this time capsule of a period in time, the period they were made, the period they were released, everything about them. And not to mention also like the, you know, the views of the people creating it as well. Mm-hmm. But <laughs> I think it almost stands to show how far we've come that some of that mm-hmm. language isn't acceptable anymore. Yeah. I think the one thing that kind of, um, it, it, you know, it kind of annoys me as we talk about this podcast, right? Yeah. I couldn't say, I think what kind of annoys me with the one thing is like, I couldn't be like, wow, they use this word a lot and I can't say the word, <laughs> you know? And I think that's what is like, that's like where I start to like cross the line of like, I feel like that's a little extreme because I think that mm. a word that's being used, it should be like, what is the, what is the reason that it's being used? If it's being used to be hateful, then that's bad. But if it's being used as like, I can't believe how much they say blank. It's, yeah. you know, you, you, in my opinion, you should be allowed to say it in that moment. I'm not going to say it here on this podcast because it's on YouTube and I don't know what YouTube's going to take down, but I do feel like they should say it, but it's the garden state word. It's the survivor Palau word. It's the, it's the, you know, it's used a lot in this movie. It's a movie that had mm-hmm. a totally different, it was being used in such a different way in the late nineties, early two thousands than it is now. And mm-hmm. it's become like, you have to call it the, the letter word, you know what I mean? Which like, yeah. it's, it's crazy. Like there's very few words that have that. And for that to be one of them. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's just interesting how our, our culture has changed to that level where I wouldn't be comfortable. And it's the R word for anybody who's listening here. Um, that's, that's what you'll put there, but it's, it's, it's crazy that our culture has changed that much in 20 years where I wouldn't be comfortable even saying on this podcast, this is a word that is used a lot in this movie and I can't believe it. Yeah. But they were putting it on CBS, they were putting it in this movie. They were using it as the main joke in Garden State for a period of time. Mm-hmm. It's just, it's, it's just crazy. And like that's why when I watch movies, I watch movies for what they are. I sit down, I enjoy them. There's gonna be things that are said. There's gonna be things that are done. It's always about what's the intention. And like, I don't know. Like mean, but it's funny because certain movies will be crapped on for using that type of language and like thrown to the side. But Mean Girls has mm-hmm. such a cult following that it's not, which is kind yeah. of interesting because, you know, when I was watching it this time, I was like, man, Regina George has a mouth on her. But then I'm mm-hmm. like, nobody talks about that as like what Mean Girls is. So I think it kind of depends on what the movie is, too, and who's saying it, it whether or not people will kind of disregard it. I think like the depiction of it is a, a very important thing. I think the way it's being used in context is really important. And I think what Mean Girls does is it really showcases how that word was being used at that time. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Obviously, like there there are there are a lot of words. It, it's I, I wouldn't say it's like the extent of the use of a different word in like a Quentin Tarantino movie. Yeah, of course, of course. Right? Like it, it doesn't get to that extent. And it feels like it's capturing the time. But again, that's us who grew up in that time saying mm-hmm. that. Who knows yeah. what the younger generation feels about the use of that word in that in this movie? Yeah, that's true. That's true. I mean, because we don't. We, that's the one thing we will never know is what does the younger generation feel and think about these things. Yeah. But before we move on, because. I don't want this to be this one to be too much longer than what our other ones are going to be because these are going to generally be like a half hour and I don't want to lie to our our <laughs> people here who are then going to go over and become patrons and also for anybody who's listening to this uh to this podcast there won't be aud- there only be audio on Patreon there won't be video but it'd be weird to do this YouTube <laughs> video without video. Um what are your hopes and expectations for this musical that's coming out? Do you think it's going to be good or do you think we're in for a disaster that's going to potentially ruin the um the i don't know the cultural influence of this movie i've heard a lot of really good things about this musical in general like like the Mm -hmm. stage production of it and everything it's interesting it's interesting because this we we talked about how timeless this story feels but it still feels really set in 2004 Mm -hmm. so i'm really interested to see how that translates looking at the cast i don't think the cast is as overly stereotyped as the 2004 cast is Mm -hmm. 
and I'm interested to see how that goes. I'm I'm very willing to give it a shot. I do. I quite enjoy this movie. It's hilarious. They've kept some of the original characters, like Tina Fey's reprising her role. Tim mm-hmm. Meadows is reprising his role, and Tim Meadows is hilarious in this movie. Mm-hmm. Um, but overall, I don't know. If, I don't think it's going to hit the same way the original does. But it may resonate more with a younger generation. Yeah. Yeah, Tim Meadows was so funny in this movie. I'm glad you brought him up because we just went a whole half hour without talking about him. Tim Meadows plays the perfect principal in this movie. Um, Mm -hmm. He just nails that that mentality um, so well. Uh, And the the line delivery is 10 out of 10. Yeah, I personally, I think this is going to be a money grab. I really do. Mm -hmm. I think this is a money grab to try to say, hey, guys, it's been 20 years. Remember Mean Girls? And then what's going to happen is this movie is going to get like average reviews. And then people are going to go back and look and say, oh, but remember, go watch the other one. And I'm hoping that people don't go back and watch the other one and all of a sudden start to have a bad taste in their mouth over it if they haven't revisited in a while and say, oh, well, this was said or that was said or I can't believe they're getting away with this. I don't know. We'll see. But I I don't know. I don't have I don't have the highest expectations for the musical coming out. Also the fact that they're trying to kind of hide the fact that it was a musical is mm-hmm. it's really confusing to me and doesn't, it doesn't sit well because I feel like your audience would be pumped that it's a musical. So I don't get what they're trying to do with that. Are they hiding it though? Cause the trailer clearly has a musical number in it. The new trailer did the original trailer didn't have any musical numbers in it. And also oh, I, remember I, I, this, movie, the this movie does have the, the jingle bell rock scene which yeah. is technically a musical scene, right? So you could show somebody dancing or something like that, but it's, oh, they're doing it in... No, like, this is a full-blown musical. This is going to be a totally yeah. different thing. So, But it's the same story, is it not? I believe so. That's interesting. Yeah, I don't know. As I know. So I, a, I'm really interested to see musical. how it... Yeah, I'm interested to see how it... I know it's changed some of the things, because I when did the musical first hit Broadway? I don't know. Yeah. Um, That's not as easy to find as when did a movie come it out. It is not as easy to find. Uh, showed its final... Uh, it debuted in October of 2017. Oh, so it's not actually that old. No, it's only like six years old. In fact, <laughs> okay. the fact that it's becoming a movie already is pretty weird. In it's pretty shocking, honesty. yeah. That's pretty fast. Yeah. But I don't know. I'm interested to see... I know they. I know some of the characters are different mm-hmm. in the musical, so that'll be interesting to see how that's changed. Uh, I just don't know if you can hit the same comedic notes as you can in the original, mm-hmm. but I'm okay if it's hitting different comedic notes. Yeah, because yeah. there are some pretty funny movie musicals out there. It'll just have to actually manage to balance both of those things. Can it balance the musical with the comedy and keep the same characterizations? Because mm-hmm. really, and this is my final point on this movie, because I do think at the end of the day, 20 years old, this is a movie that stands the test of time. This is a movie that is yeah. still should be watched, is still enjoyable. It kind of towed that line, it kind of bridged that gap, as I already talked about. And it's it's a good, solid female teen comedy that is also for men as well. But my my final point, and hopefully I can still remember what I was going to say. Oh, yes. The characters are really what make this movie. The comedy is there because of the characters. The principal character, Regina George, her sidekicks, Katie, um, you know, the way Katie's view of the world is. That is what makes this movie. And so I'm hoping that they are able to manage to balance the music, the characters, and the story and keep it all as one and make that work. Mm-hmm. Who the hell knows if it'll actually happen, but I don't know. We'll probably end up watching it. We'll probably end up doing it for our okay. podcast. Uh, who are we kidding? Nothing else comes out in January. So we'll do it, but let us know what you think. Yeah. Uh, it, it's just Mean Girls is part of this cultural zeitgeist, and I think it became so much bigger than anyone ever thought it could be mm-hmm. to the point where there is actually a Broadway musical based on it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah. So this Mean Girls – um, the next episode we're going to be doing is the mummy again, that'll be over on Patreon, patreon.com slash the specialists, become a patron $5 a month, get you every week, every Tuesday, we're going to be doing one of these podcasts. And then in addition, every other week, you're going to be getting the Q and a 
um, which will be survivor related, regular questions, whatever questions you guys really want to ask. That's also at the $5 tier. And up until the survivor premiere of season 46, Will is also doing his new era rewatch where he's rewatching 41, 42, 43, and 44. And those are coming out multiple times a week. So if you want to test the water, see what being a patron is all about, become a patron, check out all those episodes. There's a little bit of a backlog now. So there's, there's some going on there and then know that coming up is the mummy from 1999 the terminator forrest gump and the karate kid so that's going to be the rest of the month of january uh five tuesdays in this month really really making us get our money's work out to people <laughs> money's worth out to people so thank you all so much for listening hope you enjoyed the podcast leave some comments let us know let us know what movies you'd like to hear us talk about if you you know <laughs> You know, if you're if you're considering becoming a patron, things like that, what movies would you like to hear us talk about over on this? Because five dollar Tuesday is really it can be anything. It can be yeah. anything. As you heard, we're talking about a little bit more of like pop culture type movies, but it can really be about anything. So that's it. That's what I got. We'll see you all next time.